Um, this is the bit where you all get t-shirt envy here. It's, kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's, like, it's like reservoir dogs, but with penguins. <laughs> uh, so hi everyone, I'm uh, Martin Weller. Uh, I'm the director of GoGen. We'll talk about GoGen in a minute. It's great to have you all here. Um, OER is definitely my favourite conference. I think, you know, I think like a lot of you, kind of post-pandemic, I'm reconsidering what I do in terms of conferences here. If I could only do one conference a year, it would be OER. Although well, maybe in Hawaii now. Hawaii. <laughs> uh, it's great that Catherine's here. Catherine Cronin was one of the co-chairs of uh, the Galway Conference in 2019, uh, which was the last face-to-face -face one we did. Uh, and I think little did we know then, Catherine, what was going to come with it. So maybe that's a kind of, there's lesser for that, I think, just kind of cherish these moments while they're here because you don't know what's going to happen so it's great you're here this is your first OER conference you're really welcome it's a lovely community uh, and it's great to have you here you're coming back it's great to have you back so um i'll pass over to my co-chairs who can introduce themselves so back can you go next thanks so much martin and hello everyone it's <coughs> fantastic to be here and i'm really thrilled to see everyone um my name is beck pitt and um I'm part of the GoGen uh, team, and um, in case you haven't um, heard of GoGen before, we're the Global OER Graduate Network. We have around 130 members and a network of 200 kind of friends and experts that also kind of support what we do. And we provide support to graduate students, doctoral students, working on open education topics um, around the world. So a real international community. Thanks. Hello, I'm Paco Niesto, and I'm uh, really happy to be here after all this time. Uh, yeah, I have gone through uh, the process of being a member, uh, alumni, and be part of the team. And uh, yesterday we had the, the chance to have our uh, first face-to-face -face seminar with 80 students around the world. So uh, yeah, that's a great thing and really looking forward to staying with you all these days. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rob Farrow. I'm a researcher at the Open University and one of the GoGen coordinators. Um, OER was actually one of my first maybe the first open education conference I attended. Uh, and if you know the kind of work that we do, you'll know that we've been doing full-time open education research since around 2012 or so. So it's quite an honor and quite a journey to actually be one of the co-chairs now, it's quite exciting. Uh, but it's even more exciting to be in a position to actually congregate and meet with people again. Because um, it's been a long haul, right? The last couple of years, uh, quite isolating. So, um, this is the kind of moment where you know you kind of would hope to get to at certain points in the past. So it's just quite exciting to be here, and it's really lovely to see everyone. Well, thanks, Rob. So I think we've got a couple more slides to say before we go into the keynotes. Um, oh, it's the other button. I see. So here's some stats. So uh, it's taking place over three days: uh, synchronous and asynchronous, and um, hybrid, online, face to face. We're trying to hit all, all the targets, all the things, all the methods. Uh, participants from 20 different countries. Uh, 29 scholarships have been awarded so people can attend free if they want. Uh, over 80 different sessions uh, over, and 200 participants. So I think that's kind of really interesting, although the face-to-face -face is bijou and select, I think, you know, that's what we can call it. I think it's kind of really good that the hybrid Routine event conference. is kind of hitting the sort of numbers that, that we used to get. So I think people are still engaged in this. So uh, follow along on the, on the hashtag there, OER22. Uh, I want a big thanks to our friends at Reclaim Hosting for sponsoring the conference. Um, I'll do the pitch for Jim. Jim Green's not here on the team. But uh, yeah, if you, if you need hosting for websites and stuff, Reclaim are the team to go to the end of So that, with that, that's the end from us. And we're going to move into our uh, keynote, so, which I get to chair. So uh, I'm really pleased our opening keynote um, is going to be Rob. Uh, but mainly Brian Mathers, who's the guy behind all the penguin drawings. Uh, and I think they're good. if you're wondering why penguins, uh, that all will be revealed <laughs> in the next bit. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Rob and Brian. Thank you. Okay, so this is mainly a Brian session, not a Rob session. Um, but I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction. Um, so uh, let's see, does this work? No, by the way. So uh, Brian is the one who's really responsible for our kind of um, visual identity in GoGN, which um, has been very powerful and been a very good way of kind of communicating our, our what we're doing and, and connecting people. Uh, this is our um, a logo um, that Brian designed for us, and you can see the inverted Earth in the corner with the global South as the main projection rather than the North. 
And this, these are the kind of like really, really nice, interesting ideas that Brian brings to this. This is the kind of uh, like a, a travel ticket from the golden age of travel. This is one of the concepts that uh, Brian helped us develop. Um, uh, here you can see his notes when we were just kind of going, yeah, we want something like this and we're not really sure, but here's a load of ideas, can you make sense of all this? We were trying to work out what do we want to um, say to people about what GOGN stands for and why people should consider joining the network and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you can see how the process works. Brian's so good at just kind of drawing your ideas out and kind of making something coherent and uh, visually interesting out of them. Um, it's time for the penguin explanation. So, Brian can claim partial credit here. Um, the original thing with the penguins was when we were first getting some swag done, it was like, you can have a stress penguin if you want. And uh, we were like, well, yeah, PhD students, they're kind of stressed, but maybe we should get a penguin, right? But then obviously, the penguin kind of took off a little bit. Um, the thing is, it was really Brian that brought the whole concept to life and brought the penguin uh, into the heart of it as a motif and a character and a kind of avatar for people to connect with. Um, if you, uh, uh, so yeah, we've had this golden age of travel kind of motif and this, this fed through to some of the outputs that we do and the guides that we've created. Um, I won't spend too long talking about these, but these guides and these outputs from GoGN uh, are the ones that Brian illustrates and does the covers for and helps us to really draw together into something quite unique, I think. Um, and so, in a way, Brian, you're the kind of missing member of the Gojo <laughs> team. You know, it really is that much of a, a, a good, close working relationship. So, if you want to see some more penguins, have a look on the Gojo website and you can uh, check out all these uh, books that we put together. And with that, I will hand you over to Brian to do something very visual and interesting. Um, I appreciate this is a bit of a tough gig because of what has gone before in the last couple of years. And if you're like me, you know, I have a low level of social anxiety, you know, bubbling up and COVID comes along and sort of just notches that up a few, you know, a few, uh, a few bits and um, I feel like we've really got to practice being social again. Um, I guess it's maybe a little bit different if you're an introvert or if you're an extrovert in terms of how you see that, but um, anyway, it's a real privilege and so I'm just saying thank you to you for coming and, uh, and, uh, and getting social. Okay, good. Right, we're all good. Right, let me see. I will just... That's right. Good. I am a lot more visual than I used to be. Um, if you know me, uh, you'll know that I started my career as a software engineer um, and I have uh, built software and grown teams uh, and sold two businesses um, and about 10 years ago I found myself inside a corporate business that I had sold a business to and slowly my soul was being drained <laughs> um, um, and it was then that someone introduced me to uh, Stylus and a, an iPad, okay? And um, having not really, if you'd asked me, could I draw, I would probably told you no at that point. That was sort of about 10 years ago. Um, there's something about a stylus and an iPad that is very forgiving, okay? In a way that a pen and a piece of paper isn't. Uh, because you can undo very easily with a stylus and an iPad. And, um, and since then, the styluses and the iPads have got a lot better. In, in particular, the, the Apple Pencil is is incredible. Not that I'm a salesman for Apple in any way. But um, fast forwarding a little bit, um, in, in the work that I do now, uh, openness is at the very heart of it. So I was, uh, uh, thanks so much, Rob, for <laughs> teeing me up. Uh, so nicely and uh, I may be making it look as if I'm a magician you know when it comes to uh, creating all these things but if you've worked with me before you know that my process starts with conversation okay and um, I was uh, reflecting with some of the conversations we had with uh, some people in Kenya and some people in Myanmar uh, with some of the couple of open university projects we did um, 
and language becomes an issue, you know, in terms of encouraging people to be open. Because I know that if I can get people talking about stuff they care about, that outcomes grow, right? Um, and it's sort of gold in the way of uh, humour, humour chiefly. I'm always on the lookout for humour, um, both dark humour and, uh, and light humour. Dark humour is probably even more powerful, you know. Um, and uh, so I should actually have been on the side all along. But the punchline was, I, I'm more visual than I used to be. Anyway, right. Um, but it's that openness really that uh, feeds into all of the stuff that I create a visual thing through. And every so often I forget about it. Ever so often somebody says, oh Brian, you're so good at drawing. Could you just draw us a thing? And, and I'm like, oh yes, of course, I'm a magician. I'll just draw that thing. And then I realize, oh no, I, I've missed the essential part of the process, which is to have the conversation, to get people talking, the people who know about the stuff, get them talking getting them being open about it, and in therein are the truths. So all of these things, for, for all of the class I've created, it all comes from those conversations. So I was just going to uh, add a little bit to my Mona Lisa here, and see if this works. So get on with it. <laughs> sort of changes what you see, doesn't it? It's just that one little speech bubble that sort of changes what you see. And, and uh, comic strips, uh, something that, again, I have learned a lot about in terms of the power of reducing something to a single black line, but that people identify with and, and can empathise with, um, and that says something. Um, yeah, I, uh, again, I, was, I, I touched briefly just on how much I've learned from the OER community. Um, you know, from working with Audrey, Audrey Waters, I learned the power of metaphor, you know, in terms of that page. <laughs> um, working with Alt, I, I've learned a lot about live scribing, uh, and, and really uh, Alt gave me that opportunity to, you know, come along and try to capture and create a landscape of a conversation. And that, again, it was a series of experiments, but um, I learned so much from what then people saw in those visual landscapes. Um, and go to you saw the visual language. Once you have visual language, once you've settled on uh, like the golden age of travel or penguins and the golden age of travel, really, you can go in all sorts of directions. You know, it's, it's really so powerful. Um, uh, and sometimes finding and defining that visual language is quite, is quite a process, but once you've got it, oh my goodness, it's, it, you, can, you can go fast very quickly. And from reclaim hosting, uh, I, I learned a lot about aesthetic, so how something feels, because I've realised that you process how something feels way before you sort of cognitively process it, if you see what I mean. So if there's words involved, so it's why I suppose pictures work so well on Twitter. You absorb the picture and then you read the sentence, you know what I mean? But, but there's a subliminal level there that, that you can't do anything about. It's all read, you've already had a reaction to it, you know? So the aesthetic of how something feels, you know, becomes important. And if you don't believe me, just ask Comic Sans font, <laughs> you know, because, uh, um, oh, in fact, I was thinking just before this, uh, just before this talk, uh, I've often found contracts you know, like a legal contract, very sort of overpowering, right? Because it's always in Times New Roman font. It's sort of saying, I'm an authoritative document, right? And you probably don't have the knowledge to be able to process this legal text, you know? But if you, if you change the font to Comic Sans, well, how would that feel? You know, a, 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 you know, a hard document, but in, hey, it's, it's primary school, you know. Um, so how something feels is, is actually really key. And I, I get offended very quickly whenever I see things that people have spent a lot of time on that really don't have any visual element at all or, or, or somehow have a, uh, 
or make me switch off, I guess, because they maybe are just Times New Roman, no diagrams. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, don't get me started. Um, there's something about um, how we empathize with the simplicity of just two, two dots, you know, and a, a, and a line. You know, we can't help but see a face there. Right? And if you've ever received an email from me, you'll notice that I, I always sign off my, you know, my email with a little sideways colon and a bracket, right? And it's basically saying, I'm sending you this email with a smile, right? Because without that, emails are neutral. But of course, nothing is neutral. Because we paint in colors that aren't there. So when you read an email from someone, you, you paint in meaning that isn't there, that isn't intended. I'm the worst at this. I'm seriously, I'm painting in all sorts of things that I think people are thinking about me, you know, whenever, whenever I read something, right? So there's something about, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, that sort of human element of sort of two dots and a, um, and a line. And uh, let's see, um, you know, if, if you draw a little self-portrait, Drawing me as a self portrait is pretty easy. <laughs> Just a circle, you know, and triangle, and, you know. I, I, there's been a few times when um, uh, I've done a self portrait drawing element as part of a workshop, and um, it really is a bad idea. It's a terrible idea. Because how you see yourself is not how you're seen by other people. And even the strongest of people, and I, you know, sometimes I'm sort of yeah, do me a little, draw. you know, not done a little drawing, and uh, and it's like really, like <laughs> my ears are there, what you? you know, and there's all these layers of complexity that we put in ourselves that uh, that means that actually drawing humans are is, is quite problematic, you know, and um, but that's why penguins are such a good idea, mm -hmm. right? Because with penguins, you know, uh, we can we can say a lot through them. We can't help but empathise with them, right? Um, and if you think about it, penguins uh, are are cute and cuddly, right? Smile away, boys. Um, but they're also community uh, birds. You know, they're, they're, uh, the picture I have in them in terms of um, Antarctic, uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to say the word colony in, in this context because I know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe be taking out of context, um, community is a better word, um, but sort of penguin communities, but also these penguins know about survival, you know, they deal with harsh conditions, um, but to draw they're also a dream in terms of the in terms of the contrast, not yellow, the, uh, the, the yellowy orange you should know in terms of the feet and the big. So I suppose I strong armed GoGM into using penguins sort of more and more because they're they're perfect for for our cartoon, they're perfect for um, you know to be able to, to communicate through, to be able to make them dance, you know, to play the tuba. Um, I'm sure penguins have a good go at playing the tuba. I should credit Mark Meller here, actually, um, because I'm just remembering that he does have a drawing that I did of him as his profile on Twitter, which is brave, I have to say. So, but maybe it's because it features his dog as well, and maybe that's the maybe that's the trick. Um, now let's see. Well, um, I, so yeah, pe penguins also relatable, you know. Uh, Again, this, is, this came directly from a conversation, as, as, as all of my things do. Um, uh, you know, some of the, I, I, it might even have been Rob, you know, sort of saying that you know, nothing's, in some way, nothing's changed because uh, I'm still in the room, you know, sort of getting things done. But we can play that through a pen, um, and, and, and uh, 
So it's that's that, that's that humor that I was talking about earlier. But penguins can also um, help us understand things that are difficult. And of course, they, they, they do and they don't, right? It's, it's cognitive ease, isn't it? It's that feeling that if you've got a bunch of penguins looking at these big words and going, yeah, okay, yeah, all right, that somehow your initial default response is, well, I can understand this too, okay? And it's just that little bit of cognitive ease that helps you step into something, um, as opposed to a, you know, a Word 2003, you know, uh, diagram that sort of feels like, oh, this feels too hard for me to understand, even if it's the same diagram, but it's just your initial reaction is one of defense rather than one of embrace, right? You know, pe penguins can give us a different perspective, I think, um, in terms of just even looking at words from a different angle. It's a, it's a very obvious little trick, really, but, uh, uh, you know, a penguin making a snow angel, which I'm sure they do. Um, but also, uh, um, penguins can help us to reflect, I, I guess, on what has has been a tricky time, you know, in the last last couple of years, um, and to help us to, to process that. So, it, you know, to wrap up, um, what's the penguin saying? What's the, what's the penguin saying on this board? Any suggestions? Caption competition? <laughs> I'm not just a mascot. So I think what started off as uh, as a, actually a really lovely idea in, in Gujian, where uh, if I get it right, that you were sort of sending this on to uh, the participants of the network and they would take a photograph of her. here's the penguin in Barcelona or here's the penguin in Fiji or wherever the penguin got to. The idea that the yeah, penguin is not just a mascot, we can, it can be a, a companion on a journey or it can help us understand things or it can, it, can, um, it can help us process some pretty heavy things too. Okay, so we're going to draw some penguins, okay? If, if you're if you're up for that, but of course, in drawing anything, I'm going to give you three golden rules. Right. So rule number one: Do not overthink this. This is not your PhD. Okay. <laughs> this is like your journal that pretty much no one will ever see. Okay. If you approach it like your PhD then you probably revert to the version of you in primary school where somebody is going, that's not right. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's really easy to overthink things. I am um, the worst at overthinking things. Um, and that's where just a little bit of encouragement and a little bit of process really helps. Okay? Rule number two, play it cool. Okay? And what I mean by that is that um, if you're not in the way of drawing every day, which I guess most of you probably aren't, um, then your hand's going to make a mark that your eye's going to go, well, that isn't right. Um, and by playing it cool, it's just like, just go with it. Okay? Um, because I think to think of drawing something as an outcome only is missing the point. Right? It's more of a conversation with your page. And some of the best stuff that I've created has been accidental, right? Has been, you start somewhere and actually a different idea appears or you add a different little characteristic or, or the, the bird that you've started to create, the, the penguin, starts to tell you what it wants to be. And that's this third, uh, third rule, follow the idea, right? Even though you start off with, oh, what I'm trying to draw is this. If, 
If it takes a little detour, follow the detour. You okay? You okay? You with me? Good. Um, I should say that I also have this, uh, this t-shirt I'm wearing, limited edition. But I'm going to give the opportunity for you to share your creations. And, um, and not that it's a competition, but it's a competition. You know, like, <laughs> one of those sort of things, right? Um, and I know this session's been recorded, so we'll, there's a t-shirt for, for, for the live participants um, and a t-shirt for, uh, for those that are maybe watching our footage, okay? So how do you draw a pen? Have you got pens ready? Are you going to go with me? Right, okay. So, how do you draw a pen? Now this is where it gets a bit tricky, because I usually, I've got classical music playing in the background, I mean, you know what I mean, and there's no pressure, but at the minute there's pressure. Anyway, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do this. Right. So, let's come up with the thing, let me see, correct it. Right. So you're sort of drawing some sort of shape like that as the penguin body. I'm going to try that again. It's like a, a cucumber that's sort of fat at one end or something. I don't know. What do you, what do you think that sort of shape is? It's a... Uh, it's what's it? Eggplant. Eggplant. Yeah, it is a bit, it's like an eggplant. You know, absolutely. It's, actually, it's actually really helpful to think in shapes uh, quite often. Usually in sort of YouTube tutorials they tell you to sort of think in shapes. Anyway, and, um, and next I'm sort of drawing a, a little beaky, you know, big part. And um, if you just draw a little triangle just like what I've done, if you, if you, if you sort of do the, like a little, just the, the top of that beak on the top there. Um, and then draw in sort of two eyes, and you find that actually the eyes are the killer. You know, if you, if you, it has a very different feel if you draw them close together or far apart. Or, uh, but experiment and just go with, go with how it is. And then um, if you sort of draw sort of two circles around your eyes, and. The, like of, of all the penguin things I've created, um, most of what's doing communication are the eyes because they're not saying stuff. They're, you know, there's no speech bubbles. There's no, and it's just, a, and they're almost like looking at you, going, "Hey, I'm playing a tuba. Haven't you seen a penguin play a tuba before? You know, or something like that. I don't know. It probably is different things in different people's heads, but right. Um, and then there's this, there's this sort of. The white bit just here on the, you know, yeah, and then um, let's think about flippers. So, yeah, and it, again, don't worry about drawing over things or just extra lines or anything like that. Just go with it. You still with me? Good, yeah. right. Let's draw some flippers, because the flippers are sort of like... Sort of two flat squares poking out, yeah? And if you want, you, you can just sort of tidy up and connect those little flat squares at the bottom. And then you have a penguin. Right. Now, one other trick I'm just going to um, show you. Like, I know that obviously I'm on an iPad and you're probably not on an iPad. Um, but to make a thing lift off the page, you've got to think about where the light comes from. Okay? And um, I'm just going to, on this, so the app that I'm using is an app called Procreate. And so I'm just going to use a layer underneath. And I'm just going to use a grey, but I'm just going to show you this and you can decide whether you want to add a little bit of shading to your drawing, okay? So let me see. Um, so I'm, go I'm thinking that the light is coming from over there. So everything on, on this side of the penguin is going to be shaded, right? And the difference that this makes is massive. 
okay? Even though you get comic strips that don't have any shading at all. But um, obviously the, pen, the penguins that I tend to draw do. So I'm thinking, right, well the body is where we're probably going to cover that bit there. There's probably a bit there, and there's a wee bit under the flipper there. Right? And there's probably a little bit on the beak maybe even as well. There's maybe even just a little bit of a shadow that then the penguin has. And the difference that that makes in terms of it then becoming a 3D thing that steps out is, is, uh, is massive. Okay. Now then, we're going to have some fun. So, I want you to think of some sort of prop that you can give your penguin. Okay. So you can see that I've just drawn a few props right here. Most of them are properly silly. But um, also, if in doubt, cheat. Think of something simple, right? Don't go for something very complicated. Um, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with a penguin with an umbrella or a penguin holding a can of soup. I hear they like soup. Fishy. Right? But think of a prop, whatever prop you want, and add that to your penguin. It might, here, it might even just be a hat. Hat's actually not a bad, not a bad thing. Right, I might draw it. Let's see. Let's see. Right. Have you had a good drawing a prop? Any prop? Good. I know that's quite tricky because you're inventing this yourself, but that's alright. Um, and then lastly, the last thing I want you to add is some sort of statement. Okay? So you can think about, uh, maybe an obvious one is a thought <coughs> model. Okay? But ask yourself, look at what you've created and ask yourself, what is my penguin saying to me? It might capture an emotion that you're feeling, you know, um, or it might just be speaking back at you, <coughs> complaining, I don't know. Um, whatever it is that your penguin's saying, see, see if you can capture it. And obviously there's different ways to do that. Um, penguin holding a sign is quite a, you know, tucked under its uh, flipper is quite a good idea. You know, sandwich board, holding a big box, wearing a t-shirt holding a sign, whatever it is. And then just write a little message on the front of that. So let's see, I'm gonna... It's lovely seeing heads down, people working away, there's some tongue sort of You're getting into it. Well done, well done. I like, and I, I totally appreciate that, again, if you're in the habit of doing this, this is maybe a little bit easier. If you're not in the habit of doing this, this is getting out of your comfort zone. I applaud you. I applaud you because it is good, definitely good for the soul to create. Um, but also, there's lots of cheats here. If you've drawn a penguin once, drawing it the second time is a lot easier, right? Because uh, I've watched the most professional cartoonists, right? And they will draw things in pencil and then draw over it in ink, getting two cracks at the. Uh, 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 and, you know, it's, that's, that's almost like cheating, you know. 
But seriously, it, I often will do, draw stuff on pen, take a photograph, and then draw over it, um, and have two goes at it. And of course, it all, it's definitely better. Right. So, when does one abandon their artwork? You know, um, because artworks are only ever abandoned. You've got to sort of stop at some point and go, okay, well, I'll, I'm going to share that. I'll move on. Okay. So let me give you a, a place to abandon your, your artwork. Um, uh, the remixer machine um, allows you to essentially share a photograph of what you've just done. Okay? And I'm briefly just going to show you how to do that. Um, the URL is a bit of a long one, I'm sorry about that. So it's remixer.visualthinkery.com slash g slash c slash oer22 So remix of a visual thinker and that's a little private gallery just for oer22 Okay, and I know some of you have used the remix machine before see people typing. Right, I'm going to just flip to it and then this is the remix of machine. And essentially you can, oh, I'll tell you what I need to do. I need to save my drawing. So this is my drawing here. And I'm just going to save that. Save image. Okay, I'm going to go back here. And then there's a little change photo bit at the top. So if I click that, it will allow me to go in my photo library and use that. And then I can sort of zoom in a little bit and drag it in the center. And then when I'm ready, I can press publish. Publish. And then you will see that my little example is down at the bottom. So if you get a chance to do that, then I would love to see what you have created. If that doesn't work for you for whatever reason, because you use your Twitter thing or your Google thing, that's also okay. If you want to come and show me, I'd love to see it anyway. If it's doing it on the train on the way back to Edinburgh, uh, you know, and, and, and adding it then, then that's okay too. Just whenever you get two minutes, see if you can add um, uh, add your your creation to the remix gallery. And I'll just put that. Um, I will just put the URL back on there just in case you need it. Now, listen, I'm going to leave it there. I have used up all of my time. Uh, it's been lovely to speak with you this morning, and um, thank you for uh, humouring me by actually drawing some paintings. Mm -hmm. All right? Thank you so much.